you, ladies. That was a beautiful song, and I appreciate that. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 22 this evening. When I had the joy to be with you several weeks ago on a Wednesday night, we spoke out of this passage of Scripture, and I'd like to just continue if we could. It's a beautiful song and a great truth. It kind of goes alongside with something we may get to this evening in this passage of Scripture. Thanks for being here on a Wednesday night and here for a Bible study. I so admire your, your faithfulness and uh, appreciate your, your being here to hear what the Bible has to say. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith makes God pleased. So without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So by obvious deduction, the more the scriptures I have in my heart, the more faith is built. The more faith I have, the more opportunities I have to please the Lord. And that's why we need to be in church and need to be in Sunday school classes. And we need to hear the Word of God and read the Word of God daily. Listen to it on your iPods and, and uh, on your iPhones. And listen to it as you go to bed at night. Put it on your, in your children's room if need be. But let, let's get the Word of God in our hearts. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Sin complicates my life. It always has. And uh, I want to do anything I can to avoid sin. Sinful behavior, sinful actions, sinful associations. I want to be, be away from those things. Proverbs chapter 22 is a great chapter. I want you to focus your attention on verse number 1. Let's read it together, please. 22, verse 1. Everyone, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Father, speak to our hearts and help us as we think about what it takes to establish a good name and, Lord, to obtain loving favor. I pray that, God, you would help me. I certainly two things I'd like to get in my life, and I'd like to go through my entire life having a good name and certainly obtaining the loving favor of you first and foremost, and then, when needed, the loving favor of my brothers and sisters and fellow man. I pray that you'd please help us as we think about these truths. In Jesus' name, amen. These are two things that you and I, just uh, right off the bat, says in, in Proverbs chapter 21, 22, verse 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. If you had the choice between a good name and a lot of money, millions or billions, Solomon says here to his son, a good name is more valuable than that. And then he says, and loving favor than silver and gold. I have a sweet friend who sometimes in kindness to me and in generosity and thoughtfulness, he says to me, your friendship is more valuable than gold and silver. And he will give me a little gold piece or a little silver coin or even a bar of silver. But the Bible tells us that loving favor is more valuable than a whole stack of gold and silver. Now, most of us have heard this verse, and when we think about this verse, we oftentimes think of the words a good name. And certainly all of us, when my name is mentioned, your name is mentioned, people deduct an opinion. Early, late. Always on time, tardy. Pay their bills on time, are negligent in that area. They borrow a lot or they hardly ever ask for anything. Lazy, diligent. Faithful, nah, not so much. A faithful friend or someone is not so loyal. Your name and my name, we've been working on it for all of our life. Truthful or liar. Very careful with the words or very speculative and letting corrupt communication come out of their mouth. Going to sexual innuendos or, or they're very above reproach in how they, how they speak. Everybody has a name and people find when your name is mentioned, people automatically go to an opinion. Hard working. So a good name is very valuable throughout the entire life. You don't have to be popular to have a good name. You don't have to be uh, famous to have a good name. But your name does speak of, an, of others' opinion of you. So he said, that's very valuable, son, as Solomon was said, his, his son. And then he says, and loving favor than silver and gold. Now, favor is something you'll see often in the Bible. You'll see that great men of God 
obtained favor. Daniel obtained favor of his authorities. Joseph obtained favor. of the two, two men, you just have to really work hard to find dirt on in the Bible. And God tells the good, the bad, and the ugly. But he doesn't say too much negative about Daniel or about Joseph. Even the Bible says of the Lord Jesus in chapter 2 of Luke, it says that he grew in stature and uh, he grew in, in wisdom and in favor with God and man. Those are things you and I need. You're going to need favor your entire life. I need it. You need it. You need favor when you go to the grocery store. You need favor when you ride the freeways or the highways or the interstates of our city. You need favor when you stop at a stoplight or when you're in a hurry. When you go to the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, you need a lot of favor there, man. <laughs> Wherever you go throughout life, you need favor. And you need favor, first of all, from God. And the Bible tells us that God looks for opportunities to give favor to people. I just want to give you a positive thought, but friends, you and I need the favor of God. I really would like God to help me. The Bible says he resists the proud. He pushes against the proud. He keeps them at bay, but he gives grace to the humble. So I think this passage of Scripture teaches me, number one, that it's really important to keep a good name. Number two, it's really good to obtain God's favor and the favor of my brothers and sisters and fellow men and women around me that I negotiate life with. And then it begins to tell us in chapter number 22, here are some things that we can do in order to have favor with God and man and to have a good name. We'll review a few things we spoke about already, but let's just look at verse number 2. Number one, he says, the rich and the poor meet together, and the Lord is the maker of them all. In this chapter, over four references are there to poor people. But I just, I just uh, verse number two reminds me that I need to be free of prejudice. God despises, there's a lot of things about God that's really wonderful, and, and all things about God are wonderful, but one of the attributes of God is he is not a respecter of persons. God is not prejudiced. He does not pick one group over another group. Uh, he loves everybody. God loves people more than anything. He doesn't judge them by their social status or by their ethnic background. He loves everybody. Do you do that? If you want a good name and I want a good name and I want to have the favor of God, I've got to figure out how God thinks. Those are the boys and girls that grow up in my house. One thing I need them to help me with is to learn how I think. Dad thinks different than other people. Sometimes I'll ask him those things. Dad, nobody's dad tells him to do that. So, well, you're not nobody's dad. You're my dad. You're my son. You need to do it my way. Figure that out. Well, dad, his dad doesn't make you do that. So it doesn't matter what his dad makes you do. You're my son. We're going to do things this way. You know, and it, we're God's children. We need to figure out how God wants things done. One thing he does like it. He says here, the rich and the poor meet together, and the Lord put them all together on the same planet. Get used to it and treat everybody graciously. Well, we have to write that. What causes us to be prejudiced and biased against people? I think you nail it down to one, boil it down to one thing, pride. We think we're better than somebody else. We didn't pick how we were made. You didn't choose which house you live in, what continent you were born on. Those are things that God gave you. And we need to learn, learn to love people free of bias. Number two, number three, he said, The prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself. How can I have a good name and obtain loving favor? Number one, I want to remember to be prejudice free. Number, number th verse number three says, The prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. He said, Be prudent. And what does it mean to be prudent? It means to avoid questionable attitudes, associations, and actions. It's better to avoid temptation than to resist temptation. You saw tonight, we, we read one of the songs that Brother Quote So Let Us In, yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. I like what the, the model prayer says, deliver me from temptation. One of my favorite prayers to pray is the prayer of Jabez, when Jabez, whose mom named him Sorry. You know, could you imagine? What's your name? Sorry. Your mom named you Sorry? Yes, because she bore me with sorrow. That's what his name meant. I'm like a sorry person. And yet, sorry had enough, enough uh, 
about him to go to God and say, Lord, would you bless me a lot? And would you enlarge my coast, give me more opportunities for influence? And then, Lord, would you hold on to my hand through life, put your hand upon me, and then keep me from evil that it not grieve me? And the Lord answered Jabez's prayer. I don't think anybody's name here is named Sorry. None of your parents probably named you a bad name because you brought them sorrow because you were born. So all of us have a good chance to go to God with the same prayer. But I love his last part. Lord, keep me from evil that not grieve me. Well, we, we ought to get reminded how wicked and miserable and terrible sin is. Sin complicates life. Sin's the world's greatest detective. It always gets its man. <laughs> it, it, it nails it. Be sure your sin will do what? Yes. Sin always, life is hard without sin. Sin complicates life all the more. He, said, he says here, the prudent man foreseeth evil and says, you know what, I'm not going to try to resist that. I'm going to avoid that. But the simple man pa pass on and are punished. So I think if I'm going to have a good name, I've got to avoid questionable attitudes. By the way, attitudes become actions. So you got to get, get the thinking right first. My wife was telling me today, and we were speaking about one of our children, and, and she said to me, John, I, we're going to watch so-and-so's attitude. They're not doing anything wrong right now, but I can see the attitudes coming for an action. And we're going to sit down and speak to them about that. Because if I don't deal with that, and by the way, parenting, when we parent children, and I'm not a professional with this, I don't know exactly how to do it. It's my first time. I'm having, I'm having a hard time figuring it all out. However, I will say this, but we have to deal with attitudes, or attitudes will become actions. So he says here, deal with questionable attitudes. Deal with questionable associations. Just a reminder, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, be not deceived. Don't kid yourself. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You hang around the wrong kind of people, you're going to start acting and thinking like them. Can't lay with dogs and not get fleas, I think my father used to tell me. Can't do it. You're going you're to you're get a mess if you hang around the wrong kind of people. And then any kind of action, avoid it. Don't try to resist it. And by the way, you keep a clean life, you have a better chance to have a good name and loving faith. Look at the next thought real quickly, verse number four, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. And first of all, we, the, next, the first thing really is practice biblical humility. Now, biblical humility is not walking around saying, I am a dirt bag. I'm just an old dirt pot. I'm just a sinner. I'm wicked. I'm terrible. I'm telling everybody how terrible you are because you have one pronoun that's very prominent there. It's I and me. Listen, someone to say, you know what, I'm the greatest, I'm the, I'm the greatest thing since ice cream came around the world or what have you, that's a prideful person. So is someone who says, I just don't feel good, I just don't feel, I'm just not worthy. No, it's still the same pride. The focus is still how I think, how I feel, and what I want. Biblical humility is understanding that, God, uh, that God's big and you're small. God's strong, he's always been strong. I'm weak and I'll always be weak. I always need him. Practice biblical humility, and then the fear of the Lord. I spent some time on this, I believe, in the message I shared with you, but I believe there's two things you and I need desperately. Uh, we need to fear the Lord. And to get those two things, we need to hear God's word and never fail to return God's tithe. We won't spend time today talking about that, but whenever you and I hear the word of God, faith and fear is generated in my heart. The right kind of fear. Not I'm afraid of God, but God is with me, and I know he's with me. When I return God's tithe and I assess how he's given to me and then I commit it to the Lord by bringing it to the church where he told me to bring it, there is a fear factor that is created within me that is very good. And there's many blessings to fearing the Lord. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, beginning of knowledge. It's, to, it's strong confidence. It helps me hate evil. Uh, it gives me the secret of the Lord and so many other things that come with fearing the Lord. Let's hasten if we can. Verse number five, the Bible says, Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward, but he that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. I want to just give you the thought here on this, right? Keep and guard your heart or your soul here. The Bible says, Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. That means a guy who just keeps breaking rules, that's just kind of bent to do the wrong thing. 
That guy is looking forward to a life of thorns and snares. Scars and traps are what you see men and women who are forward end up having. Then he says here, in verse number, verse number 5, he says here, He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Now, what does it mean to keep your soul? I don't know everything about the, about the scriptures. And I've got a, I'm in a lifelong learning curve of learning what the Bible says. But I love what the lady said tonight. The problem, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And dealing with the how and the soul, they say the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotion. How a person thinks, what they want, and how they feel. It's very different in all of us. Our desires are different. We have different love languages, they tell us. Some people are, are loved when they're spent time with. Other people don't really care about time. They like gifts, and other people like words, and lots of things that, that make it. We're, we're very different. God made us different in our souls, and our thinking, and our feelings. When a cat gets run over on the, on, the, on the side of the road, some of us go, oh, other people go, hallelujah, another one died. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you where I'm at on either one of those things, but uh, everybody has a little bit different feelings about things. Some people watch Little House on the Prairie, and they do love to watch it because they get a good cry in. I like to laugh at the watch when someone's getting ready to cry and start laughing real loud and start saying, isn't this terrible? No. Dad, you ruined it for us. But everybody has different feelings, different desires, different uh, thinking processes. But those have to be monitored. They have to be guarded because our thinking, the Bible tells us in this, was sung tonight in, a, uh, excuse me, um, I've forgotten where it's, Jeremiah 17, 9, where the Bible tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who knows the heart? Who can, who can, you know, we, you might think, you know, I, I remember one lady came to my office years ago and she told me, she said, uh, Pastor, there's a guy in church and I really feel like he's the one. I said, well, that's wonderful. Let's pray about it together and we'll see what the Lord does. She came back about a month later and she goes, Pastor, there's a guy in the church. I think he's the one. I, I feel very deeply he's the one. I said, that's a different guy. I said, she said, I know, but I do I feel like it's really happening. <laughs> I kid you not, she came back the third time about three months later, and she had a different guy that she felt like. You know what the deal is? She was going by her heart, and her heart can feel very different. can feel very strongly. Your desires are affected. I remember, I, and all of us have had this happen, where you, you wanted something real bad. How many got something you wanted real bad and didn't like it after you got it? Sure. Sure, because our feelings are deceiving. Someone said that's why we have to go back to the Word of God. Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. Our warrant should be the Word of God. Nothing else is worth believing. Though all our hearts should be condemned for want of some sweet token, something I put my mind on and my desires on. It can really get confusing. So we need to go back to the Word of God and, and let God dictate our soul's desire. Why Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Allowing him to govern our thoughts and, and help us with that. My mother's favorite verse is, is uh, Psalms 37, verse number 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give thee the of thine heart. Well, if we focus upon the Lord and delight in serving Him and delight in knowing Him and, and spending time before Him, then our desires are tweaked so that they are very beautiful. And God delights to meet those desires for us. If I'm going to keep a good name and obtain the favor of God and my fellow man, I need to be careful to guard my thinking, my feelings, and my emotions, how I feel and what I want. Look at verse number 6. Let's read it out loud together, can we please? Train up a child in the way he should go. Much in the book of Proverbs is spoke about train up a child. Dr. Vogel does a great job with his books on that, and I also have read Brother, Brother Mrs. Cowling's books, and they've been really a blessing to me. 
and others who've written. I hope you'll, if you've got children or you have children, I think it'd behoove us to spend some time reading books and, and thinking about some of the philosophies of others who are doing a good job with that. The Bible tells us to train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. I realize there's a little bit of an argument. Is that a proverb or a promise? I like to think it's, a, it's something that we ought to practice. Certainly. I'm not going to argue about those things. You want to argue about those things, just meet me outside after the service. If I'm not there in five minutes, start without me. <laughs> but I will say this. I do believe that you and I ought to train up our children. I think to have a good name and loving favor, we must give attention to mentor and modeling godliness before our children. Well, children, they do come with instructions. You have them in your lap. Come with the Holy Spirit that can help us and guide us with that area. But they need training. The problem is training takes a lot of time. It is easier for me to rake my yard than it is to train my children to rake the yard. I mean, I can rake my yard now, not, not, the, not the yard we have here. I don't, I, mean, I don't even know how many leaves fall in our yard here. But in California, I could rake my yard in probably no more than 15 minutes. But it takes me 45 minutes if I do it with my children. They're picking up little leaves. Dad, you see this one? This was really nice. I said, son, we don't care about leaves. We rake the leaves. <laughs> rake, 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 rake. Like this, like this, like this right here. Okay, and then, Dad, this rake is heavy. Can we do another rake? No, son, use that rake. So, said, Dad, there's three little bugs down here. Come look at these bugs. I don't want to see bugs who want to rake, son. Rake the leaves. Oh, it's, it's painstaking to train our children. And there's nothing you can do except for spend the time to do it. To teach your children the Word of God, to get around time. Boy, it's, it's difficult to do those things. But it takes time to train. It takes time to mentor. And it takes special godliness to model. Monkey see, monkey do. More is caught than taught. Parents, be careful. Your attitude will show. Your conversation, there are two ears back there to listen to you. If you got more kids, they got more ears. They can hear what you say, and they can hear your tone about the teacher, about a decision the principal makes, about something that, that someone said, and your attitude towards some other lady or other men. Listen, those kids got sharp, sharp, keen attention to those things. Train up a child. Children always reflect their parents. I remember going to a gymnasium a few years ago, and our boys enjoy playing basketball, and I enjoy playing, watching them play, and it's fun. But in the early days of watching, uh, watching our sons play, we'd go to the gymnasium, and I'd see if our kids made a shot or did some good play, I would, yay! And I, and I sit down, and I look, everybody's looking at me, you know? I'm, 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 I, 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 they watch my son play, they see him make a basket, and they look over at me. And I'm going, hey, you know, waving at everybody. Another good place. Yeah! Everybody's looking at me again. At the same time, I remember one kid, he, he, was, uh, he was out there playing, and he got angry and frustrated. He missed a, a wide-open layup. And then uh, when, whenever he got the ball back, they stole the ball away from him. And the process, the guy stole the ball away from him. He tried to trip the young man who stole it from him. He was just frustrated. I've been there too. But here he was, he was frustrated. He was laying at the half-court line. He just, we just, everyone saw him. He just tried to trip the kid going to the basket. The referee blew up the finger, and he was like, what do you want me to do? He fouled me down. He said, take this. That's what I'll tell you to do. <laughs> and that doesn't mean time out if you don't know basketball. That means I'm going to tee you up. You're getting a technical foul. And he got upset, and the coach pulled him off, as any coach should do when a kid loses his temper. Sit his backside on the bench is his greatest ally for a coach is, a, is, is the bench when he doesn't want to behave himself. But I watched him as he walked back, and he stomped back, and he sat down on the bench. And then I watched his parents. Everyone watched the kid, and they started watching the parents. And I felt so sorry. The parents were embarrassed. They were ashamed. They, were, they didn't know what to say, and all they could do is feel eyeballs looking right at them. 
Do you know that exact, that scenario happens to God too? Whatever I do, people look at me and they look at God. You and I, we have moonlight Christianity. We have no light within ourselves like the moon has no light. It's just a big rock up there. We're supposed to reflect the sun, the son of God. Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. So when people look at you, they look at you, and, and you and I are supposed to reflect the Lord. God convicts me about that oftentimes. That's why I think you ought to wash your car, take care of your house, love your family, especially if your neighbors see you walk out of church on a Sunday morning with your Bible in your arm. Yeah, I think, you know, those people are the real deal. They're real Christians. They don't hear you screaming obscenities or getting mad or slamming doors or doing anything that would cause them a blight upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here I say this to you, a good name has to be, is developed because our children, if you don't spend time, if I don't spend time with our children, they're going to be a blight upon us. They're going to hurt our names and it seems like they'll limit the favor that God gives us. Yesterday morning, we were dropped off at the airport with, with eight of our family members and 16 bags of luggage and a car seat. And we managed to get everything together, and the Lord gave us real smooth. We put that in there and got that onto the plane, and then we walked through the airport. And, of course, when you walk the airport with, average, with a large family, I'm sure the Bachmans know all about this. <laughs> Everybody and their mother just goes, there's eight of them, you know. How many kids you got? Haven't you ever heard of a TV, you know? And boy, they'll think of all kinds of things to say. You think it's your job to populate the earth? I say, you know what, I never, I don't know all about that, but I can't imagine life without the last one. I never met an old man say, well, I had too many kids. I've had lots of old men tell me, I wish we had another one. Wish we had some more kids. Nonetheless, and I know God can't give everybody, doesn't he, he, it's his choice to do that. But as I think also, as I, as I think about that, those kids reflect me. The little stewardess got on the plane, and, and she was in the back. We were, we were all together, and we took up three rows of the airplane. And the lady at the back, she said, those are all your kids? I said, yeah, they're all our kids. Any of them twins? I said, no, none of them are twins. They all came one at a time. <laughs> Same questions all the time. Everybody who has a big family has heard all the questions. But she goes, it always amazes me how a person like you can bring seven kids on a plane. We only brought six, but she thought we brought seven. Said, a person like you can bring seven kids on a plane, and they're so nice and polite. And someone brings one, he's a total, holy terror. I said, you know, we get a little bit loud. He goes, oh, your kids are not loud at all. They're sweet kids. And they say, thank you, after you give them their, their drink and their peanuts. And they're polite, and they picked up after themselves. They crossed their seat belts after they got out. She's just really happy with that. But you know, those kids are mirrors of their parents. And if I can give some time and investment in, in Linda, she does a lot more work of that than I do. But through a godly mother they have, and then periodically a loudmouth dad that they have, they can, they can bring us a good name and loving favor, not only from God, but from others around us. Let's pick up one more real quickly, if we can, please. In chapter 22, verse number 7, read it out loud with me, if you would, please. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is a servant to the lender. This verse is kind of put here, and of course they're proverbial in the fact that they have different scenarios. Some proverbs have themes, and I think there's themes in chapter 22 of themes of parenting, themes of care for the poor, and things of that nature. But in the middle of this work, right after verse 6 where it says, train up your child the way you should go, he says, the rich rule over the poor. Now, that's just true. That's, that's, he who has the money makes the rules. But he says the borrower 
is a servant to the lender. Solomon says, listen, when you borrow, you become enslaved to the person that, that loans you the money. The borrower is a servant to the lender. There is a connection there. See, what Solomon is saying is that debt creates additional masters. You know, they have a credit card is one of the common ways that people get in debt today. One of them is called MasterCard. Makes you feel powerful. MasterCard. Actually, they become your master. See, I don't believe that. Get your statement and see how much interest they charge you. They'll get you over a barrel, and they've got some long nailed attorneys that will, will put life screws on you. Yeah, debt creates additional masters. Debt does some things, and I think, you know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, in, uh, 13, in the, the, the chapter talking about primarily paying your taxes, he said, owe no man anything but to love one another. There's a freedom that comes whenever someone is without debt. Apostle Paul says he's a debtor to all men to give the gospel to them. And I found that as an individual and as a church family, we ought to work very hard to stay out of debt, and if we're in debt, to get out of debt. What does debt do? Debt does several things. First of all, it just downright discourages us. It's discouraging to have to look into debt's eyes every day. When you work hard and even God blesses you and you get extra money and then you owe it, it just discourages you. Debt also distresses you. It causes you undue stress. It just, you know, it's difficult enough just to get a, work a marriage out, just to get along with one another and love and mash your lives together midstream and raise a family. But when debt is there, it causes more stress. When the bills, when the bill collectors call, when good things happen, you get a bill the next day of a credit card statement. It distresses you. It discourages you. Debt also oftentimes divides people. Whenever somebody owes someone money, it brings division. That's why I encourage people, don't, don't, uh, don't do a lot of loaning money. I don't think there's anything sinful about loaning money. But I think it's probably better is if you're going to give, if you're going to give money, do it and realize you, you may never get it back and you're okay with that. It's a better way to do it because sometimes loaning people money changes their memories of you. If they can't pay it back, then often they'll avoid you like a bubonic plague. It'll keep them, there's people who won't come to church tonight because they owe someone money. There's rifts sometimes that are just difficult because money is, the, it is, a, it is a heart problem. The Bible says where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. Very few things become more personal than finances. You could ask me a lot of things. You could say, John, you know, where'd you go to elementary school? How many kids you got? What's their birthdays? I'd probably tell you that stuff flatly. You told me, asked me some other questions, very personal to me. Well, your dad, when was he born? Well, how old is he when he died? I'd tell you so many things about my family, my personal life. But if you said, John, how much do you get paid every week? I'd say, hang on a second. Well, he said, that's not a big question. Uh, let me ask you this. What's your bank ledger? Can I just see your bank book? I'd like to see how, how you, your checking account. I'd like to see how you spend your money. I'd say, hang on a second. You're writing a book? Leave that chapter out. <laughs> I'm not telling you that. Now, I've given you a lot of personal stuff, but where did I get lockjaw when you came talking about my money? Now, if my wife asked me that, I would give that to her freely. She said, hey, John, how much do you get paid every week? I'd say, I'd get paid this month. She said, hey, John, can I see the checkbook ledger? I'd say, here. Why would I give it to her and wouldn't give it to you? Because she has something you don't have. She has my heart. And finances causes problems and debt causes division oftentimes. Many marriages fall apart and divide because of financial obligations. When people uh, borrow and get into some difficult times. That's all to say, I don't think all, all borrowing is sin. I don't think all debt is sinful. But I would say this, I think we have to work very hard to get out of debt. <coughs> There's a freedom that comes when someone is debt free. There's a freedom that comes when our church is debt free. I don't know how, 
And uh, you, you probably know much better than I, but as I, I look over our church, I think, Lord, I've been praying since the moment you asked me to be your pastor. God, please help us dissolve the debt. Dissolve the debt. We can do more for God, for, for eternity, for missions, if we don't have debt. It's a passion for me. I, I don't know how we're going to do it. We're going to have to do some things, and God's going to help us. But something's very important. I think it's important to God. And I want, and I think First Baptist Hammond has a good name in our community. We pay our bills on time. I think that we've got a good name, and, and God's given us favor. But boy, that has to be established and reestablished over and over again. We'll have a much better name if we don't have anyone we owe. When everything is current, everything is paid on time, and, and, every, and every, bill, every bill is taken care of, and there's no debt. You'll have a much better name when you don't owe anybody. When I don't owe anybody, we're, 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 we paid everything completely off. Say, Pastor, that can never happen. You know what would be amazing to me? I think most people attack debt casually. What you cannot do casually in decades, I believe you can do in months oftentimes, in very short years, if you'll get deeply committed. Maybe a while since you go out and eat out in a restaurant someplace, you took that money and put it toward debt. Maybe some cuts you've got to make in order to get that done. It will give you more freedom. It'll give you less stress. It'll give you le more courage. It'll give you less division. And certainly, I think the last thing that debt does, it oftentimes disqualifies us. There are things that you and I, sometimes when it comes to a, a missionary or something God lays in your heart or someone has a need, and you know God impulses your heart to do something for them, but you know you can't. It's because MasterCard bills, Visa bills, American Express is sitting on the counter at home, and you can't do what you want to do because we owe. Debt creates additional masters. And I think if we want a good name and a loving favor of the Lord, we'll have to deal with that. In review, just real quickly, if I want to have a good name, and obtain the favor of the Lord, I think, number one, we need to be prejudice-free, deal free of prejudice. Number two, avoid questionable attitudes, associations, and actions. Practice humility, fear of the Lord. Keep a guard over my thinking, my feelings, and my desires. Submit those to the Lord Jesus Christ. Give attention to mentoring and modeling Christ before my children. And then guard against debt or work hard to get out of it. Let's pray together, can we? Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for people who are interested in hearing what the Bible has to say. Thank you, Lord, though probably three or 4,000 years ago, these words were given to a son from a very wise man. They're very applicable to us today. I pray you'd help us to apply them. Teach me things. There's certainly things in this very chapter that I don't think I understand completely. More study, more time, more illumination from the Holy Spirit of God needs to be done in my heart, and I pray you please help me. I long to be taught by you. I long to, Lord, to go to church with people who, Lord, have caught your attention and value what you value. Thank you for your goodness to us. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name.